Hi there, everybody. My name is Sean Sublett, and I'm joining you from the central part of the Delaware Valley, uh, Climate Central. Climate Central, for those of you who are not familiar with us, we're a science and communications organization based in Princeton, New Jersey, and basically our, our MO is to communicate the science and the impacts of climate change to the public. And this is part of our Climate Matters program, our continuing educational series of webinars uh, that help you, the journalist and meteorologist, stay in touch with what's going on uh, in the climate sphere. So thank you for all for, for joining us. Today we're going to talk about the next generation of climate models. You may have heard the term CMIP-6, the Coupled Modeled Intercomparison Project, uh, phase six of that. And we're going to have a, a wonderful guest who's taking some time to join us today, uh, Claudia Tibaldi, to, to kind of walk through what all that means. A little background on me for those who are not familiar with me. My name is Sean Sublett. I'm a meteorologist here at Climate Central. I'm a meteorologist on the air for 20 years in Virginia uh, for taking the job here at Climate Central just about five years or so ago. Uh, and we work with nearly 800 meteorologists across the country, 350 journalists across the country. Uh, our weekly program called Climate Matters provides tools and resources for you to tell the climate story uh, to your audience as you need to do it. All right, so a few logistics about what we're going to be uh, doing here today. Again, the overview is what's different about the next generation of climate models. We're not gonna go very deep into exactly how climate models work. Uh, many of you are meteorologists and you understand the fundamentals of mathematical models. So we're not gonna get very deep into that. What we do want to look at is how we've seen these models change, what's new about them, what their strengths, what their weaknesses are, what we can expect here in this new generation of climate models. We do encourage questions from the audience. Uh, if I'll be the proctor of the questions. What I would ask you to do is use the chat function and direct the questions to everyone. Uh, and if they're relevant, I will kind of jump in and, and uh, ask some of our guests in midstream if, if we think it's relevant. Otherwise, we can hold some of the questions back toward the, uh, the end of the hour. And if you have to leave early or you know somebody who wanted to join us but couldn't, uh, we're going to record the webinar and uh, I'll do a little editing later on this afternoon. We should have it uploaded tomorrow to our website at our media library. Uh, that's medialibrary.climatecentral.org slash workshops and webinars. And everybody who's joining us today, uh, send me your email and I will send you a direct email to that link uh, so you don't have to write all that stuff down. Okay, so having said that, I would like to welcome our guest today, Dr. Claudia Tibaldi. She is a scientist with the Joint Global Change Research Institute. Her research interests include analysis and observations of climate model output in order to characterize observed and projected climate changes and their uncertainties. The goal here making this information useful, the modeling and estimation of socioeconomic and environmental impacts. Claudia has published papers on detection and attribution of climate signals, future projections at regional scales, and the use of multiple climate model projections and impacts of climate change on agriculture and human health. Claudia is currently a lead author on the upcoming sixth assessment report of the IPCC Working Group 1, that's the physical science basis of climate change. Claudia's got a PhD in statistics from Duke and was a researcher at NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research, for most of her career before moving to JGCRI in the summer of 2019. So with that, uh, I would like to turn it over to our dear friend, Claudia Tibaldi. Claudia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear well, me? I hear you just, just wonderfully. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and there you are for everybody to see, and it is all yours. Go ahead and, and share the screen and start us rolling, please, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you, Sean. And I don't know if you said that, but I'm, I actually have the honor of being associated with Climate Central myself as a science advisor of some kind. Yes, you <laughs> advise us always, very well. It's we, always very been a, a pleasure to, to do that. Um, so uh, let me see here because now, of course, I don't, yes. There we go. Uh, can you see my presentation? And you probably also see yourself. 
And we have the new tools, yeah. new insights, next generation yeah. climate models. Okay, models. okay. So, um, so my idea here is to keep this fairly short to allow for a lot of interaction and question. And I have to apologize, you may hear a cat meowing because I'm at home and <laughs> I, I have no, no way to uh, compartmentalize them. Um, so uh, I'll keep it fairly short. I will focus on you know, the new uh, experiments that will provide the basis for our you know, um, no, new understanding of future climate projections and um, to introduce the general idea of CMIP, um, the Couple Model Intercomparison Project, I would like to show a video that I didn't prepare. It's available on the website of the World Climate Research Program, which is the umbrella organization under which CMIP is organized, has been organized for decades now. And um, they have this four minute video that I think is uh, well done and fairly comprehensive, gives a nice overview and for sure will generate some question. So we will start with that, then I'll have a few slides of my own, and then we will open up for questions. Does that sound good? That sounds wonderful, Claudia, okay, go ahead. So um, I'll have to, you'll have to tell me if this works, but I'm gonna click on the, <laughs> on the link and the uh, video is gonna play now on my screen. Can you hear and see? I see it. Okay, can you hear as well? Do not have audio from the video yet, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. So how do we do this now? <laughs> I wonder, hmm, I hadn't thought about this. Well, I thought I heard the audio when we tested earlier on. Uh, is, the, is the audio up? Oh, you know what? It's because I have my headphones, so <laughs> Yes. Yeah, Sorry. that might do it. <laughs> okay, let's try again. We will rewind and start. Again. There it is. We have it. Let's talk about climate and Earth system models. They are very complex bits of computer code that allow us to understand the Earth system and to project future climate. The model results serve as the basis for climate research around the world. The World Climate Research Program organizes an intercomparison project so that scientists can share and compare their models. Yes, we call this CMIP the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. It involves more than 30 groups around the world, um, more than a thousand researchers, and probably produces of order 20 to 40 petabytes. CMIP also sets standards that specifies experimental protocols. By following these and by using the same climate change scenarios, the climate outputs can be analyzed collectively, resulting in better climate projections. The CMIP models are also key to international climate assessments and negotiations, such as, for example, the IPCC assessment reports. CMIP outcomes are used for understanding climate change impacts. For example, precipitation, which is critical to agriculture and to human living conditions. And also, for example, the changes in biogeochemistry of the oceans are critical for fisheries, particularly ocean acidification, which has a fair effect on coral reefs. Let's look at outcomes of CMIP models. On the spinning globes, we see the temperature difference relative to an average of 1986 to 2005. By using the CMIP multi-model ensemble, we can produce a more robust product. The clear colors show us a robust outcome for the temperature change, while the gray colors indicate areas where the temperature change is smaller than natural variability. So we still have some uncertainty. Yes, we still have some uncertainty, but the models clearly show us two different futures. On the left, we see an optimistic future with low carbon, high renewables, and strong international cooperation. And on the right, we see high fossil fuel use, low renewables, and fragmented cooperation. Ah, sort of business as usual. Yes but the CMIP models show us our very clear choices for future climate. Currently the sixth phase, CMIP 6, is underway. All right, what is the new or has been improved? Many of the models will run at higher resolution or will include additional processes that were not simulated in the previous models. 
and new CMIP evaluation tools allow researchers to analyze the data. We also improve the infrastructure and the documentation to help them find what they're looking for. And how do we ensure consistency within CMIP 6 and with prior and future phases? Well, each group runs historical simulations and a handful of common basic experiments organized through the so-called experiment. Diagnostic. Evaluation. Characterization. Team experiment. How many projects participate in Team Experiment? More than 30 groups around the world have registered their models. We have 21 model intercomparison projects endorsed by the CMIP panel based on their relevance to the grand challenges of the World Climate Research Program and to the fundamental science questions of CMIP 6. CMIP 6 also allows more freedom to the modeling groups by uncoupling the research experiments from a fixed IPCC deadline. In that way, we offer flexibility to our researchers, but remain highly relevant to international assessments. We expect CMIP 6 to continue the CMIP tradition of major scientific advances and are looking forward to the results. Yes, the CMIP process and products represent one of society's most important sources of high quality and reliable climate information. Okay, now you see my videos here that you're not interested in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let well, me everybody needs to stay in shape, Claudia. It's just <laughs> fine. Okay, so um, you know, I, I am tempted to to say, are there any questions? But maybe I should go through my slides that are not that many, and uh, people can maybe jot down questions as uh, as we go along, and we can answer them at the end. What do you yeah. think? That sounds great. If somebody just, if somebody chats me a question, I'll be happy to kind of jump in. Okay. Um, so uh, let me now share my PowerPoint. And. We have gone through the video, and now I'll uh, I'll go and hmm, let's see. Okay. Looks good. Okay, so um, CMIP, as we mentioned, is the couple model intercomparison project, and that's really what I'm focusing on here. Um, it's a large activity, as it was uh, discussed and, and um, described in the video. And it's, a, it's an old activity, at least relatively speaking. It was started in 1996 and it evolved over time from a very small you know, set of experiments run by 10 or 12 um, climate models around the world to the current one where there are probably thousands of experiments if you, if you gather all of them across that wheel that was shown. Um, and uh, we have more or less 40 uh, models and maybe 30, I think it was said, um, modeling centers around the world participating. And as you see on these slides, um, historically, the various phases of CMIP3 have always been uh, associated with a phase of the IPCC report because, um, you know, even just from from a from the third assessment report uh, in 1997, I think um, the um, understanding was that to make climate projection robust, um, you need more than one model, even more than one or even more than two or three models. You have to gather um, uh, the larger ensemble. Um, that you can get. And um, I, sh I should also say, though, that uh, for us interested in future climate change, this is the aspect of CMIP that is most, you know, obviously interesting and known. But CMIP um, guides the uh, concerted experiments of with climate models over a really wide range of issues, not just future climate. In fact, there is a MIP that is about paleoclimate. So it takes, you know, the opposite 
uh, perspective and tries to understand changes in the far past of, of the Earth. Um, there is a MIP that is just concerned with the, um, you know, biogeochemic cycle. Um, there is a MIP that looks uh, specifically at monsoons. Um, there is a MIP that looks at, you know, the effects of high resolution versus uh, lower resolution in climate models. So there are a lot of MIPs that probably you, you will never hear about <laughs> because you are not interested in the, in, the, in, in those particular, you know, research questions. But uh, CMIP as a whole really um, represents probably the backbone of um, climate science in general, not just future climate change science. So uh, uh, you said there, there's about 40 models at 30 different centers around the world? Something like that, yes. For, yeah, for and, and for, for 40 models because, you know, the same uh, research center may have different versions, they may have different resolutions, they may have a, a version that you know, um, includes the uh, biogeochemistry and another that doesn't, one that resolves the stratosphere and another that doesn't. So um, there are uh, multiple models coming out of uh, some of the larger research, largest um, research centers. And NCAR, for example, I think has three or four models that participate in CIMIP. Uh, aside from, from NCAR, uh, what other, what other yes. labs here in the U.S., uh, you know, we have a lot of meteorologists with us, so yes. are there a few uh, labs that they may have heard of other than NCAR uh, Probably. that are running some so, of the GCMs? So uh, GFDL, the Geoph uh, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab Laboratory is a NOAA lab and it's based in Princeton and participates. It's one of the, uh, you know, oldest um, um, centers participating in, in, these, um, in these efforts. Uh, NASA as a model, uh, NASA GIS as a model that participates. Um, I think in the US it's, it is these three, if I'm not um, mistaken. Um, and then, of course, there are there are centers all around the world, and I think I have a slide to show you that in a moment. But um, shall, shall I go on, or do you have other please questions? Please do. Yeah, please yeah. go. On. So you you have seen this on the video, just flashing on the screen, and I don't want to spend much time on this, but this is really the representation of all the so-called MIPS <laughs> that con constitute CMIP six. And so when I say MIP, um, these are, you know, a group of scientists out there that have come together. They have a specific interest in a specific um, research area. And they have decided to write down an experimental protocol uh, with a series of experiments that explore this or that. <laughs> and they have written a paper and they have publicized it um, across the modeling centers and the modeling centers decide if they have the resources and the interest um, in participating in this particular model intercomparison project. So as I, as I mentioned, what we're interested in, I think <laughs> the reason I'm here to talk to you is scenario MIP, which is just one of many, as you can see, but is the MIP that uh, has um, set set up the uh, protocols and the experiments to explore future projections. But uh, as, I, as you see, I'm uh, drawing the circle to include also the center that uh, represents the experiments that are common to all these MIPS. Uh, because like the, the video said, they kind of set the standards and they set the traceability from model generation to model generation. So these, these experiments don't change from one phase to the other of CMIP so that, you know, the new NCAR model can run the same experiment that the previous NCAR, the previous version of the NCAR model ran and you can kind of compare and contrast what changed in the new uh, generation. So, um, a part of these common experiments are the so-called historical simulation that are important because when we then couple them with scenarios, we can see what, what is going to change, right? So, uh, and you see around this wheel, you know, how many different MIPS, and I mentioned paleo MIPS, which is up here on the, on the you know, at 
11 o'clock, I would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, and air can meet, that is um, concerned with the chemistry in the atmosphere, uh, aerosols and, and um, pollution. Um, there is LUMIP that uh, studies land use uh, because now models have interactive vegetation and land use uh, representing the, the surface that of course is important for interactions with the atmosphere. Um, there is a MIP that studies the effects of possible geoengineering solutions and so on and so forth. Um, so here is a map of um, where the centers are and you see um, now there is, a, there is a map on something on Florida and I don't understand that. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that you see um, you know, NCAR there in the middle of the country, you see a couple of dots on the east coast, north East Coast, Princeton, and um, New York, where uh, GFDL and GIS are. I don't understand what's in Florida. Uh, I should have. Uh, it wouldn't found be the that. Rosensteel Rosensteel School in Miami, would it be? It looks like, but I I don't know it. Oh, you know what? Yes, this is probably somebody that is running experiments for decadal predictions. Uh, but but it's still either the NCAR model or the GFDL model. So it's a little bit, um, you know, misrepresenting uh, uh, the, but, but yeah, there are people there, you're right, at the, at the school in Miami that, that are interested in decadal predictions. Um, then the, the other dot there is not on Seattle, but it's on Victoria because the Canadians are participating. And then you see a lot of centers in Europe, of course, China is taking, uh, yeah, is, it, it, it is investing a lot of resources. As you can see, there are three modeling centers in China. There is one in Japan, there is one in Russia, and then one in Brazil. So uh, this gives you a little bit of a sense of, you know, the international nature of the effort. Is the one and, in Australia Cicero? Yes. Uh, oh, it's actually uh, uh, CSIRO, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's the uh, Australian model. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I know the title of, the, of this webinar is about the new generation of model and what's, what is new. Um, you probably are going to be a little bit disappointed because I won't spend a lot of details uh, on, on that, uh, I'll try to answer some questions if, it, if they come, but this is a little bit of a uh, summary representation of how climate models have evolved over time. And, um, you know, you, you see that uh, the, the large um, efforts in coupling the different uh, components went on all along, starting from, you know, the 60s, where uh, for the first time, atmosphere and ocean model components were coupled together. And that was, you know, the first uh, example of a so-called coupled climate model. But then all sorts of other pieces of the systems have been um, developed as uh, modeling components and then coupled together. Um, and so you see that we have a representation of sea ice, of atmospheric chemistry, of aerosols, of the biogeochemical cycles, the carbon cycle. Um, you have now models that resolve uh, layers in the upper atmosphere, not just in the troposphere. Um, you have representation of dust and sea spray and um, you have a uh, marine ecosystem, it was mentioned in the, in the video. And then uh, where we are right now uh, are these uh, two uh, latest type of development. And I mentioned, you know, the representation of land use and um, interactive vegetation is also part of that. Uh, so land use, of course, uh, has a man uh, made component in, his, in its um, description, but there is also just the simple representation of uh, vegetation growing. Uh, and of course, you know that as we enrich the atmosphere with CO2, um, there is a fertilization effect. And so that is 
represented now in uh, some of the most advanced models as um, vegetation growing. And of course, this is important because as it, the vegetation grows, it, it uh, captures carbon, right? So it, uh, it provides a sink for carbon and so it diminishes what is in the atmosphere. Um, but then of course there are other, as you can imagine, effects that go the other way. So the, it's important that everything is coupled so that as the climate evolves, uh, all these interactions and feedbacks are uh, represented. And then there are the very um, critical uh, components of ice sheets, uh, Greenland and Antarctica in particular. Uh, these are the, probably the, the crux of the problem for sea level rise in, in the long term. And they are also probably the components of the system that are the most difficult to model because it's not just about, you know, modeling the melting of the ice, the gradual melting of the ice or the gradual sliding of the ice into the ocean, but um, it has to do with modeling some dynamical aspects of how, um, how ice, you know, behaves and fractures and, and yes, slides, but it can collapse rather than slide, um, you know, slowly. And, and as you can imagine, these, these things are really complex uh, to model. Yeah, so, Claudia. When when we look at yeah. all those all those features that we're that we're modeling in GCMs, in addition to yeah. the characteristics of the the ice sheets, uh, what would you say are one or two of the of the items there that are are most difficult, and compared to one or two things uh, in that component in those components that we have a very good understanding of? Yeah. You know, I, I feel like it, it, is, it kind of goes with the progression over time, right? So the things that have been there for the longest have been most, um, mostly well-developed and studied and understood. And of course, compared, that's the point of CIMIP, right? Over the phases of CIMIP, uh, the idea was to learn from each other on the part of these modeling centers and compare the way one center models one thing and the way the other center goes about modeling the same thing and how the results may differ for that um, reason. And, and you know, uh, I know <laughs> some, some people may have a hard time um, accepting the fact that there is no true model out there, but uh, as you can imagine, you know, every aspect of this has an intrinsic and unavoidable uh, component of approximation, right? You cannot resolve every single process at play. Um, if, if we did, we would have models, you know, the resolution of, of uh, you know, millimeters, not, not kilometers, <laughs> and it would take forever to run one single simulation. Um, so what I was saying there is that a different, com different centers may take different approaches to modeling the same thing, or at a minimum, they may have different parameter values for the same process that they cannot represent explicitly, but they have to approximate. And these parameters, of course, are derived from observations. And as we all know, observations have uncertainties. And so different values of these parameters are acceptable. But unfortunately, it's, it's often the case that different parameters that are acceptable and produce the same result in the current climate end up having different um, effects when we start, you know, tinkering with the system and pushing the system in, in an, uh, unexplored directions. And now to go back to your question, you know, what is really difficult, um, I think, you know, ice sheets for sure, like I was saying, are really hard and, and very costly to model. You, you need a very high resolution model to, to resolve, you know, all those crevasses and all those, um, you know, um, features of the ice and the way it melts that, that um, are just very expensive computationally. And so there are people developing these models in isolation and then try to couple them with these big models where everything works together and it's, um, it's an issue in terms of computational cost. Um, 
interactive vegetation, but in general, more the carbon cycle is a big source of uncertainty. We still really don't understand exactly, for example, how this uh, fertilization effect is going to um, uh, happen, it's going to, to um, you know, evolve as we not only increase the CO2 in the atmosphere, but we may be, you know, um, impoverishing the availability of water because uh, climate change at the same time may cause droughts um, or heat extremes may kill these plants. And so um, the effects of all this is still very uncertain and, and may produce very different uh, results. You probably have heard in the past of studies that have looked at the Amazon dieback and how, you know, under certain high scenarios in the future, we were looking at the Amazon really collapsing and becoming savanna. Um, it turns out that it's a plausible scenario, but, but it's a plausible scenario in models that have a certain type of um, water cycle um, and they simulate, you know, very uh, high sensitivity of the water cycle to warming. Other models that are less sensitive don't see that kind of effect. So. That's why we use the ensembles. Um, that's, that's exactly <laughs> why, uh, yeah, that's the value of being able to compare under the same experiment what happens in one model or the other. Um, I have this slide to show that it's true that over time, you know, for this big couple model that run all these scenarios for the future, the resolution has improved. Uh, this this uh, uh, acronyms are the first assessment report of the IPCC, the second and the third, and then the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And, um, you know, that it's, uh, it's true that for some models there has been, um, you know, an increase in resolution, but on average I would say uh, we are not really seeing a uh, um, you know, earth shattering change in the level of resolution that we can um, apply for this type of experiments because we need to run these models for a very long time, you know, to simulate entire centuries um, of, um, of what happens on the earth under these scenarios. And so we cannot afford to run these models at um, very, uh, very high resolution also because we want ens ensembles even within a single model to, to uh, address other types of uncertainties that have to do more with the internal variability of the climate system. So the, 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 the same way next generation doesn't have that much of a, of a no, higher spatial no, no. Um, um, resolution. That said, there is, a, there is a MIP that is called high-res MIP where for some very, very limited experiments, they are running high resolution models, you know, even 10 kilometers, but they are more of a, you know, sensitivity analysis of the results to the um, resolution rather than exploring the future uh, scenarios. So from, from the graphic, it looks there, you know, AR4, 5, and 6 are, 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 are grids 100. 110, 110 yeah. kilometers. About 100 kilometers, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so now I just have a couple of slides showing you some new results um, from CIMIP 6 compared maybe to CIMIP 5. And um, you probably know about climate sensitivity as a concept and as a value. Um, so you can think of it as a, a number really that is an emergent property of this model. So there is no such thing as climate sensitivity as a knob in the model that you can turn and fix at a certain value. It's an, like I said, something that people compute from the results of experiments that well, double just, CO2. Just to be clear, yes. uh, and for the rest of the audience, uh, my understanding of climate sensitivity, uh, the, the very short version is that this is how much warming uh, the planet would be in equilibrium after a doubling of CO2. Exactly, exactly. So you, you, are, you have uh, described exactly where I was going. So this, this is the result of this experiment. You know, to be honest, no, no model can run to equilibrium. So there is some approximation there in the way this is calculated. But uh, for all intents and purposes, that's what is called the sensitivity of climate. 
uh, to a doubling of CO2. And it's an important, you know, synthesis of the reactivity of the system to this perturbation, right? And um, so there are models with high and low climate sensitivity um, for forever, really, from, I don't know, I think from the first assessment that was done of this value back in the 70s, probably, um, the range of climate sensitivity as the likely range, let's say, has gone between, you know, 1.5 and 5 degrees. Uh, so there are models that say that you double CO2 and going to warm only by 1.5 degrees with respect to before. <laughs> and there are others that say, no, I'm going to warm by 5 degrees. Uh, so as you can imagine, these are very different Earths, right, uh, that, that are going to be realized. And, and when we say doubling, do we mean doubling from a baseline of what, about 300 20 Pre, uh, yeah, 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 the, what, what was, um, th yeah, 300, 280 or something like that, yes. Okay. Um, so, so as I said, for several generations, all the models were in, in between, you know, 1.5 and 5, and it turns out that the new generation has several models that are much higher than that, and you see it on this slide, every dot is a model, and the value on the y-axis is climate sensitivity. So on the right side, you have CMIP6, and on the left side, you have CMIP5. And so you can expect the new simulations, even under the same scenarios that were run for CMIP5, to show some major, um, larger warming than before. Now, it's a research question that has people very excited if these models with this high climate sensitivity are as realistic as the other. And what has changed, among other things, of course, in the new generation of model has been the implementation of um, the effects of aerosol, the indirect effect of aerosol. Um, and there are some models that have a very high sensitivity to the aerosol um, effect. And so these models, I think mostly are also the ones with this high climate sensitivity. And the question now has become, let's you know, uh, try to understand if this high sensitivity to aerosol is realistic or not. And it's a very complex um, enterprise because both observations and, and models are very uncertain about that and also as you can imagine the observations of aerosols emissions historically are not as good as uh, we would like them to be and so comparing models with observation it's going to be really hard and you know i you um if you talk to a real climate modelers which i'm not uh, you may have a more nuanced description of what the issues are. Uh, there may be other things going on here. I, I think this one is one of the major ones that has changed and has created this, um, this um, new type of uh, behavior. Um, so, so here I can show you some time series now of global average temperature, and this is CMIP5 over, you know, the historical period, and you see in black observations and in colors all the models that participated in uh, CMIP5. And now I have CMIP6 here, and, um, you know, some people have started to to show that some of these models have very um, steep trends also in the current climate that are not very well representative of what happened in reality. So some of these models may be the same models that have this high climate sensitivity. And if that was true, this could be a way to, you know, to call them or to downweight them or to, yeah to be less concerned about and, and, and Claudia is the black line the observation yes okay. yes and the red line is um ensemble average okay so you see some models that are very uh you know uh, first of all with a high, large variability 
ear to ear and also some of them with some very strange trends and dips. Uh, uh, on the other hand, you see a lot of them that are more or less showing the same behavior of CMIP5. And then when you look at... But, uh, but that also, but real briefly, if you go back to that also shows that, you know, we're initializing a lot of these models or, or we're, we're kind of paleo or hind casting. You know, mm -hmm. we're starting these things in 1850 and yeah. seeing how well they're performing up to the current day to yeah. get a good feel of how strong these models are in the past to mirror what's observed right. before we promote them into the future, correct? Right, right. So that's what is done. And of course, as I said, there are also people that study paleo much, much, much older, you know, histories of climate as you can glean from, you know, proxy records to, to try and see how these models uh, behave when they are exposed to forces that were very different in the, in the very far history, uh, older history of Earth. Um, uh, but you also notice that, you know, that the, the crux of the problem is that uh, when things are stable and there is not much forcing, external forcing applied, all the models behave more or less the same. And it's when things start changing, right, that the behavior of the models start being more divergent. And that's really what, I mean, you can argue is what gave me um, a job until now, because uh, if, if everything was well behaved, there would be no need to study this and try to figure out why models are, are different and what can be said or not said. Um, and, you know, I also want to make the point that there is so much work going on about this. And when I hear skeptics, you know, um, dismissing climate models in a facile manner, and, and I think of all the resources and, and years of development and, and years of study and all, all that goes on in the community, I'd like, you know, to at least to make that point that we're taking this very seriously. And, and there are a lot of um, really good people spending their lives trying to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, these are just representation of bias, so how models represent now the spatial patterns of uh, temperature um, and, you know, just the absolute values on the left hand side and you see CMIP5 and CMIP6 and then the biases, uh, so the, the difference from observations on the right hand side and you see that, you know, the, the generation of model is very similar in terms of what was were problematic areas, they remain there, right? There are some um, areas of the world that are always more difficult than others to, to simulate exactly. Uh, but you also see that some, uh, for example, in the Eur Eurasian area, the bias has diminished. Um, so there is some improvement uh, uh, depending where you're looking. So you're saying that, um, you know, let's say the, the bottom right that uh, off the coast mm -hmm. of South America, mm -hmm. uh, the, the ensembles are coming in warmer than observed in that location. Yes. And, and like in the Arctic, the models are actually coming in colder, colder. than observed, correct? Yes, okay. yes, exactly. That's the sign of the, the bias, yes. Um, and here, you know, I was going to spend some time talking about the future scenarios, but I, I'm a little bit... Um, concerned about time. I want to have time for questions. And um, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, forget about this complicated matrix. I'm going to tell you that the new scenarios are going to be in large part very similar to the old ones. So you are, you are used to talk about RCPs, RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6, and 8.5 or the old ones. And in the new um, uh, experiments, we will have similar 2.6, 4.5, 8.5, we, we will have a seven. We will also have six, but the priority is gonna be put on seven. And it, interestingly, that's because it is thought of being more of a business as usual scenario um, than 8.5, according to some tendency now to see some policy um, you know, in effect, maybe not in the US, but elsewhere. And then you, you will also have a scenario that is a 1.9, um, 
that is a scenario that is supposed to keep the temperature around 1.5 degrees C according to the Paris Agreement targets. Um, so that's just to say that in terms of, you know, the level of um, uh, war warming, and I should say this, these numbers are the radiative forcings by the end of the century that, you know, the emissions uh, um, cause. Uh, and uh, um, you see they are similar to what we were looking at before. So you wouldn't expect a lot of differences in the projections, except I showed you that the models are warmer. And so um, uh, let me just go to this for a moment. These are time series of uh, temperature on the upper uh, row and precipitation at the global scale average. And on the left-hand side, you have CIMIP 5 and on the right-hand side, you have fewer models because this was done when we had even less than we have now um, in the summer, I think. Uh, but the point here is that um, the upper range is still 8.5, so it should give you more or less the same uh, red um, trajectories as on the left-hand side of the, of the top panels, but you see that the new models under 8.5 are warming on average by a degree more. And you have some real extreme cases of, you know, a model now that is warming by more than seven degrees at the global scale um, under RCP 8.5. And, and accordingly, also the projections of uh, pre uh, precipitation are higher uh, because, um, as you know, it goes with temperature, right? right, right. Um, so I, I think I would stop here and leave some time for questions. And I'm also happy to, you know, to stay a little after uh, okay. the hour if there is interest. Um, sorry, oh. I, tend, I tend to talk a lot. I'm well, I, well, I could keep you all day, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I know we all have things to do. Uh, the first question I have is from my, my friend Greg. He's in, in Raleigh. Uh, and this goes back to some of what you were talking about before from 1850 to the present. Do we have easily available uh, verification statistics uh, that, that we can share? Is it, or is this kind of all sometimes buried in some of the, in some of the published literature? Where, where are some easy to find verification statistics uh, for something like CMIP five, CMIP six, looking at mm. um, you know, you know how well how yeah, well some of these yeah. things are performing. That's a good question, actually. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm afraid most of it is going to be published in papers. Um, you know, if 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 one wanted to dig into the archives and then run some some tools that are available, yes, but it's not something I would want to do myself, so I cannot uh, really uh, advise. <laughs> um, so you know, what, I, we're, what we're looking to do, we really want to instill confidence in the sure, general public sure. yeah, in, in the course. veracity of, of yeah, the models and yeah. to convey that they're strong, they're not perfect, but there is tremendous amount of value in what yeah. these models are telling us. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of um, th this type of um, publicly available verification statistics, I'm afraid there is, there is really not uh, much that is easily uh, yeah, uh, gather gathered. Um, there is a website that is the closest, I think, to being you know, an, a nice web interface to look at these, uh, at these fields of temperature and also pres um, other, other variables, but both models and observations. And it's a website called the Climate Explorer. And it's- Oh yeah, uh, I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's at KNMI, which is in the Netherlands. And, you know, it's a menu driven sort of interface where you pull down your menu and you decide what you want to plot. But even that, you know, it's not going to give you exactly what Greg was asking. It's not going to give you, I think, biases and differences to evaluate, but um, it's going to give you the possibility of looking at, you know, a, a time series of a model and a time series of observations or a field from the model and a field from observation. So that's what I can think of. But if I, I may, um, you know, uh, find out if I'm forgetting something obvious and I can then let you know and, and uh, 
you guys can uh, advertise it in one of your climate matters. Or... Okay, terrific. Uh, going back, uh, this one just popped up. This is from Adam Paris. Um, and can you explain the process by which these new SSP storylines oh, are yeah. developed? Who's participating? How do these factor to the, mm -hmm. into the, the yeah. MIPs? Or, or how, what kind of assumptions are, are being made here? You know, yeah. we've, we've seen the difference between this and the RCPs from last time. Yeah, so um, it was a humongous community effort. And, um, you know, people have started looking at this, I think, in 2012, in the sense of developing the new storylines. And, uh, and it, it is a process that goes in stages. So exactly the first stage is develop qualitative storylines of uh, future, uh, you know, evolution of society and, you know, things like international cooperation, equality, um, you know, distribution of income within countries, um, uh, education and, and um, uh, that kind of um, real as I say, qualitative storyline. But then with those uh, people develop trajectories of uh, quantities that are relevant to, to this. So they develop trajectories of um, GDP and population growth and, uh, you know, technological progress uh, in terms of coefficient of technological advances. And, and these things are developed in, a, in ways that are coherent, of course, uh, so that, um, you know, you, you get um, scenarios of the future that are um, self-consistent when you look at these different quantities. But I'm, at this level, I'm re really still talking about, you know, time series of GDP and po global population growth. And then there are efforts to downscale that and start talking about how population, you know, changes within countries and how it changes within, you know, um, demographics and how GDP is distributed. And, um, and, and there are models, so-called integrated assessment models that take these uh, large quantities and model you know, the implication for sectors like the energy sector and the transportation sector um, and uh, you know, other, other parts of, of the world, um, how the world works uh, and, and produce emissions that goes with these different storylines. And that's what gets, you know, produced at the end that is relevant to climate modeling because from those emissions, then you get, um, you know, the different um, forcings that, that affect the evolution of the climate models over the future. But um, all this is all documented in papers that describe how the so-called um, SSP, um, uh, you know, framework has been developed. And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting process. And, you know, it's important to remember that these don't have the ambition to be predictions, right? Uh, nobody is so foolish to think that they can predict how the world is going to be in a hundred years. But, but the idea is to create these uh, scenarios that are self-consistent um, and are plausible and span a range of futures that can be very different. As we know, you know, we can have a, a, a world that is fragmented with no cooperation and with balkanization and where there is a very strong upper class and a very poor, you know, lower class and there is, um, you know, and everything is driven by fossil fuel or there can be another society where there is uh, more attention to equality and at the same time more attention to, you know, the, uh, our nature. And so, so this is all part of the creation of those storylines and then the, the relative uh, quantities that go with them. Yeah. yeah. Um you know, as we are a little running a little shy on time, a, a couple of uh, like briefer questions, just to, some some take yeah. home things. Uh, you know, when, as you're going through the the data from from CNIP six, you've already showed us that we're starting to see a few higher end scenarios in terms of climate sensitivity. Um, 
Are there anything, is there anything that you noticed um, dramatically different other than that uh, between phase five and phase six? Is everything kind of on pace with the way you expected or, or with the way the community expected it as well? Or is there anything that, that, that maybe has come out that has surprised you? And on top of that, you know, what will we tell somebody who, who is not familiar with climate models, this is what's different. This is mm -hmm. what's changed. So they have something tangible um, mm -hmm. to, to understand what we're doing here as a community. Yeah, I feel uh, I feel that um, you know, as far as the most um, uh, you know familiar quantities that we care about, you know, there is really no. Um, big story coming out in the sense that the patterns of change in temperature and precipitation are the ones that we have known for a long time. Um, as I said, there, are, there is this major w warming for some of the models and we will be working to see if these models are, are you know, as likely as, as the others. But um, aside from that, there is really no uh, earth shattering story coming out of the new uh, simulation and, and I feel like it's a good thing you know I, right. I feel like it means that we have understood the basic you know uh, characteristic right. of the system for a long time yeah and, that's what I was thinking we are, just, we are just adding the... detail at this point and of course you know some of the models now are becoming good enough to produce extremes that are very realistic and that verify very well with what we know about extremes uh, as observed uh, along, you know, a couple of generations ago, we wouldn't even look at daily output from the models. It didn't make any much sense to, to focus on that because um, we wouldn't trust the, the daily output of, of CIMIP3, <laughs> you know. I mean, my sense uh, is this really instills confidence on, in, in what yeah. we're doing, that we're increasing our understanding, our physics, our biochemistry, our cryosphere yeah. understanding into the models we're still getting very similar solutions mm -hmm. in this phase compared to the previous phase, which yeah. enhances our confidence in what we're doing scientifically. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right, that's wonderful. Um, I'm trying to think, I had a couple other things real quick. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, understanding the way clouds are handled by the models. Uh, and that's where a lot of work still needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of comment on, on how how the community is doing in terms of representing uh, clouds and their uh, and their pro and their uh, radiative pro properties? Uh, yeah, in the, in the I, I feel I feel as if uh, even there, you know, it's incremental progress, and there is a MIP, of course, that focuses on clouds. <laughs> so uh, CMIP six will contribute to better understanding. Uh, I know. People are running also observational campaigns that are, you know, that are going to be really valuable to observe and to compare with models. But even there, I do feel that, you know, there is no, um, uh, how, how do you say, step change. You know, it's it's going to be uh, incremental, um, better understanding and better modeling. But as you know, uh, the the problem with clouds is that you need uh, to model them at a scale that is just not possible to to do in a global climate model. And so uh, the approximation is always going to be there and it's always going to contribute to the uncertainty. Um, but part of that is the problem of aerosols, right? The indirect effect has to do with uh, how clouds form um, around the aerosols particles and where they do and, and what are the properties and the lifetime. And, and that is really crucial for these uh, climate sensitivity um, outcomes. Um, now, I know most of what we're doing here is, is global climate modeling. Could mm -hmm. you speak to, to your knowledge? And if you're not comfortable with this, please tell me. Um, is there much progress and downscaling some of this information into the regional climate models so yeah. there, there's a little more beneficial use for, for the end users, for the planners, uh, yeah. for that kind of thing? Well, there is a lot of attention to that, as, as you probably guess, and there is a... Um, um, 
an effort called Cordex uh, that uh, organizes regional climate model experiments in a coordinated fashion and focuses on different regions of the world. And you know, there is a NA, as in North America, Cordex, and there is a European and an Asian and an African Cordex. And this would yeah, I'm produce- sorry, it's called Cordex, C-O-R-D-E-X? Yes. And um, this is also part of CMIP, and, um, but they have started earlier, so they are going to be run mostly with the RCPs, the old uh, scenarios. Um, they are going to provide, I think for the most part, only um, 50 kilometers resolution um, output. But uh, there are efforts within the various, uh, you know, modeling centers to downscale that even further for, for specific domains or for specific scenarios for specific time slices in the future. So there is a lot of that type of product out there and there are gazillions of statistical <laughs> downscaling yeah. methods out there. Um, I was just talking to somebody at Oak Ridge National Lab and they are planning to downscale CMIP6, the entire archive, to I think something like, uh, I don't know, eight kilometers over the US. Wow. Um, and so there is a lot of that as well going on. You know, when we say resolution, uh, the, the last slide you had 110 kilometers. Is that is that 110 square kilometers or 110 on each on each side? On each side. Okay. And how many? And what's the vertical resolution? Oof. Approximately. I'm not going to hold you to it. No, you know the thing is, um, it's usually on pressure levels. Right. And so I don't. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, okay. Somebody has. Yeah, I always look at surface stuff, and I, I'm never really, in. yeah. Well, that's where we live, so I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, I'm not a meteorologist or a climate person, so pressure levels make me uncomfortable. Well, so. Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, I might talk to Keith Dixon over at GFDL. I'm sure oh, yes, could, he, will, he, will, yes pretty, he will answer that. And for those of you out there, Keith Dixon, he's just down the road at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab in Princeton. He did a nice primer with us a couple of years ago about climate models and the real, mm -hmm. and how they're designed. Um, yeah. And that's also online, you can go back and watch that. You know, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have Keith back with us uh, sometime in the next year or so, because he's, uh, he's, really, he's really great. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's a little after three o'clock here in the East. Uh, no other questions from the group. So I want to go ahead uh, and let you go. <laughs> I say thank you so, so much. We've been putting this together oh, for a while. It was my pleasure. It, there's so much that, you know, as a meteorologist that, that, that I need to understand and I want to understand. I mean, we, we've talked about this is, this is a boundary layer problem, a boundary value compared to initial value problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole like, climate models and weather models were really doing different things. So, you know, there's a lot of public relations, there's a lot of communications issues out there to try yeah. to convey to the public we're not doing the same thing as day-to-day -day weather, even right. though statistically, <laughs> sometimes we present it that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, Claudia, thank you immensely. Thank uh, you for all. Your time, thank you for all your time, for listening uh, and to you, Sean, for um, uh, ending <laughs> and seeing. And yes, seeing. yes, glad yes. to help. <laughs> all right, I, I want to share a, a couple things real quick before, before we turn everybody loose, and I'll share my screen real quick. Uh, this reminder that uh, this is going to, we're recording this and we'll get it hopefully at the, our website here by either late today or more likely tomorrow morning at our workshops and webinars page. Uh, if you want to go to the NCAR National Center of Atmospheric Research site, that's easy, ncar.ucar.edu. For those who don't know, UCAR is University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Uh, if you want to just email me a question later, you can at ssublet at climatecentral.com. And those of you on our Climate Matters list, uh, our release tomorrow is called Decades of Warming. It's not, a, it's not an analysis we get to do very often because it's the end of the decade. So what we're gonna be looking at for all of our 200 plus cities across the country is how much warming has happened each decade since the 1970s. Basically how warm were the 70s, 80s, 90s, aughts, and teens? 
and for 99% of our 200 plus stations, surprise, surprise, it's a lot warmer. Uh, and we're also going to kind of tease that up with, uh, with the global numbers uh, on that as well. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you again to Claudia and we'll wrap things up and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you all again soon. And if those of you we don't see, please have a good holiday season and a happy 2020. Claudia, thanks again and take care everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.